Morning. At this time, we'll call this meeting of the Board of Adjustments and Appeals for December 5th, 2019 to order. If you would please stand with me and we'll pledge allegiance to the flag. Thank you. Uh, may we have roll call, please? Chairman Taylor? Here. Vice Chairman Shahea? Here. Member Johnson? Here. Alternate Member Mander Mandernack, sorry. Here. Okay, that's the four for the moment. And, Councillor, when did you want to do your part? Now would be fit. That's good. I'd like to invite our newest member to join me at the podium. Mr. Richard Wheelis will be sworn in at this time. Sir, please raise your right hand. Yes. Left. Yes. There you go. <laughs> and you'll repeat after me. I state your name. Uh, Richard Wheelis. Do you solemnly swear? Do you solemnly swear? That I will support. That I will support. Protect and defend. Protect and defend. The Constitution. The Constitution. And government. And government. Of the United States. Of the United States. And the state of Florida. And the state of Florida. Against all enemies. Against all enemies. Domestic or foreign. Domestic or foreign. And that I will bear. And that I will bear. True faith. True faith. Loyalty and allegiance. Loyalty and allegiance. To the same. To the same. And that I am entitled. And that I am entitled. To hold office. To hold office. Under the Constitution. Under the Constitution. That I will faithfully perform. That I will faithfully perform. All of the duties. All of the duties. Of the office. Of the office. Of the Board of Adjustments and Appeals. Of the Board of Adjustments and Appeals. Of the City Council. Of, I'm sorry, of the City of Titusville. Of the City of Titusville on which I'm about to enter. On which I'm about to enter. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations and thank you very much. You are now officially a member of the Board of Adjustments and Appeals. Thank Please you. join us at, um, go around this way. Got a wire mask over there. <laughs> well, welcome, Richard. Glad, Richard. Glad to have you here. Glad and to be here. The secretary will show that Mr. Wheelis is now up on board with us, please. Thank you. All right. Uh, next item up is approval of the minutes of our October 23rd, 2019 meeting. Are there any corrections or questions anyone had that looked over from the board? All right, seeing none, may I have a motion, please? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. I'll second. Well, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Very good. All right, it's time for a little speech. And since we have such a big crowd, and I forgot myself, if you have one of these, and I know most everybody does, at least put it on vibrate at this time, it'd be greatly appreciated. We are being broadcast live over the uh, airwaves. Thank you. All right. Any person who anticipates speaking on any public hearing item must fill out an oath card to be heard on that agenda item and sign the oath contained thereon. These cards are located on a table near the entrance to the council chamber or may be obtained from the recording secretary. This meeting will be conducted in accordance with the procedures adopted in resolution number 24-1997. Those speaking in favor of a request will be heard first, those opposed will be heard second, and those who wish to make a public comment on the item will speak third. The applicant may make a brief rebuttal if necessary. A representative for either side, for or against, may cross-examine a witness. Anyone who speaks is considered a witness. If you have photographs, sketches, or documents that you wish to wish to, that you desire for the commission to consider, you, they must be submitted into evidence and will be retained by the city. 
they would be resubmitted to our recording secretary. For those that came in late, if you do plan on speaking tonight, you do need to fill out a form over here before this agenda item comes up for that item. It'll be called on. All right. Uh, staff, have the items coming up on the agenda tonight been properly advertised? Yes. Very good. Have any members of this board visited, spoken to, or had members of the public uh, relate to them about any of the items coming before us tonight? No. 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 All right, seeing no all up and down on that. Good. All right, uh, we have no consent, no old, and we'll go directly to the new business. The first item on new business is variance number 11-2019. The address is 2405 Garden Street. Staff, may you enlighten us, please. The variance number 11, 2019 for 2405 Garden Street is starts on page 11 of your packet. Uh -huh. Good. The staff report begins on page 13 of your packet. This was submitted by Mr. Woody Rice on behalf of 2405 Garden Street LLC, which is the owner of the property. The variance request is to the sign code, specifically to section 32-9, subparagraphs F1, ground sign regulations, and location of ground signs. And specifically, they're asking for a relief from the code to allow a setback of 4.8 feet in lieu of the required 10 feet from the front property line. The property is, has a future land use of commercial low intensity, and the zoning on the property is office professional. The surrounding zoning on the property is primarily commercial office related, and it, with the exception to the south of it, uh, there's a single family residential zoned property. On page 14 of your packet, uh, the property is rect um, rectangular in shape. There's approximately 195 feet of frontage on Garden Street. The use is professional office. There's a, an existing building there now. It was constructed in 1985, and we believe the sign was probably permitted at that time as well. And so the applicant is asking that the sign be increased in, in area a little bit, which, would, which is triggering the requirement for the variance. Uh, currently, the sign base where it's located is non-conforming. I'm going to read on page 14 or summarize the criteria for a variance. I won't repeat it again on the next agenda items. This is, um, these uh, review criteria will be applicable to the next two variance applications as well after this one. So when reviewing a variance request, you're supposed to consider whether there are special conditions or circumstances which exist on the property that are unusual. Um, special conditions and circumstances do not result from the actions of the applicant. Granting a variance, requ uh, variance request would not confer upon the applicant any special privilege that is denied by others. The literal interpretation of the provisions of the ordinance would deprive the applicant of rights commonly enjoyed by others. The variance granted is the minimum variance to make possible the reasonable use of the land. And granting the variance will preserve the spirit of the ordinance remain in harmony with its general purpose and intent. In granting the, er the variance, the public safety and welfare must be assured. In no case shall the granting of a variance result in a change of use, which would not be permitted in that zoning. And that's not an issue here. So at the bottom of the page, 14 of your packet begins the analysis. So the applicant is requesting a variance of 6.2 feet. Um, the code specifically says or or that a definition of a uh, monument sign is a ground sign that is erected directly upon the existing grade or artificially created landscaped berm and designed such that all means supported are concealed in a totally enclosed base that is the same width as the sign. So this is a little different from a pole sign. There are two types of ground signs that are specified in the code. There are monument signs and then there are pole signs. This is a monument sign, so in other words, the base is the same width and length as the, uh, the same width as the, uh, uh, the face of the sign itself. So on page 15 of your packet, of the, on the next page of the staff report, uh, again, the existing uh, monument sign in its base is non-conforming because of its location. It's encroaching into the required 10-foot setback from the front property line. It appears that the existing monument sign would, has been there for over 30 years. Uh, the applicant submitted a replacement sign that is larger in area, even though slightly, than the existing sign. The applicant is proposing to maintain the existing location and monument sign, of the monument base, excuse me. Uh, so again, the, the current placement of the sign does not meet the current setback requirement specified in, in the uh, code. Um, 
Not, so uh, let me just read here. A non-conforming sign may be continued subject to the following provisions. One, that a non-conforming sign should not be modified in such a way that would increase the non-conformity of the sign. So that's the issue here. There are some images that were identified provided by the applicant, which I'll point to, that show how the face will, will increase a little bit. On the next paragraph here, uh, the location of the monument base was not the result of the actions by the applicant. However, increasing the sign area causes the replacement sign to be required to meet the current sign regulations. A variance is required to allow a larger sign area on the existing monument base to be located in a 10-foot setback. Relocating the monument sign might require the elimination of parking spaces. We believe that the board could consider the variance with the recommendation that the frame of the sign should be conditioned to contain decorative masonry accents or other architectural elements proposed by staff and or the applicant. We provided to you a couple of examples that we would think might be appropriate to help soften the impact of a larger sign inside that setback along the corridor. Uh, the nexus of this condition is to request, to this request would be that the applicant is taking a smaller sign with a less of an aesthetic impact on the corridor and making a larger sign with a more prominent aesthetic impact on the corridor. This can be further justified based on the commercial low intensity land use designation of the city's comprehensive plan, which includes policies on the visual impact of commercial development on surrounding areas. So we identified specific sections of the city's future land use element of the comprehensive plan, policies specifically that relate to visual impact on commercial corridors. So the next page, on page 16, I'll just um, summarize the recommendation here. The staff recommends approval of the variance with the decorative enhancements. The existing monument sign area phase can be replaced without a variance due to its non-conforming status. Increasing the sign area would appear to be a circumstance resulting from the action of the applicant. However, imposing a literal interpretation of the code to require the monument sign to be relocated could eliminate a parking space and cause the site to become non-conforming. If the board is inclined to approve the variance, then the sign should be conditioned to contain decorative masonry accents or other architectural elements proposed by us or by the applicant. This enhancement will help meet the intent of the visual impact policy statements inside the comprehensive plan. So with that, I'm gonna to skip to um, illustrations that were provided to us by the applicant. On page uh, 23, the applicant provided a variance justification or a narrative uh, explaining the request, the need for the variance. On page 36 of the packet, you'll see an illustration of the proposed replacement sign. It will not utilize the full potential of, of 10 feet I believe is what's allowed, or 15 feet rather, allowed for a monument sign on that quarter. So I believe this will only be 10 feet, is that correct? Is that gonna be 10, 10 feet high? Is the, is the proposed sign? Okay. On page 37 of your packet, you'll see a survey that was provided by the applicant that shows the location of the sign in relation to the property line. The, prop, the front property line along Garden Street is right along the, the sidewalk. So that's the location of the existing sign. I'm not proposing to remove it. I'm just, again, only proposing to increase the face a little bit of the sign. On page 39 through 43, you'll see exhibits, photographs that are provided by the applicant to kind of give some perspective as to where this sign is currently located. I did include the sign code sections that are relevant to this on page 47 you will see uh, the, the sign code regulation. I've highlighted on page 48, uh, F1, this is the area that is, this is the section of the code that's being requested to be varied. So it specifically says, ground signs shall be a setback a minimum of 10 feet from all property lines in a landscaped area, at least equal in, si in square footage of said sign. On page 50 is an example that we had staff is proposing as a um, compromise to allow for the larger sign, some kind of decorative enhancement to help soften the aesthetic impact of the sign along that quarter. Again, this is just a recommendation from staff. This is not something the board has to accept. The applicant <coughs> probably proposed an alternative aesthetic enhancement uh, to your acceptance. With that, I'll try and answer any questions. 
you keep saying this is a little larger. Could you? I didn't. I didn't see the measurements for the old sign, or the present sign that's there. You can look on. Excuse me. On page forty-one of your packet, and you'll see an exhibit that was provided to us by an image there by the applicant. So the sign is currently rounded on the top, on page forty-one of your packet, mm -hmm. and you can see that now it'll be a boxed version type sign. So it'll be just a little bit larger because it's it's squaring it off now. So but not necessarily it, not necessarily any taller than it presently is. Uh, according to the applicant, it'll be a few inches taller. Just a few inches, okay. Okay. Any other questions of staff? Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll open up the public hearing at this time. And may I have the first card, please? Linwood Rice. Very well, Mr. Rice. Welcome, and would you please state your name and address okay. for the record, sir? Woody Rice, 505 Indian River Avenue. And uh, first of all, let me, uh, Mr. Green couldn't make it here tonight. Uh, he is on a business trip in Miami, and uh, but he did want me to make sure he, he that I asked on his behalf for your approval. Uh, the sign that, that's there uh, has been there for basically 30 years, been through hurricanes, it's been through a, uh, an awful lot. Structurally, it's very sound. Um, the necessity to go from a rounded top to a square top is that most people don't realize when you go by the Lab Corp building, there's actually two tenants in that building. Mr. Green, okay, which is the J JGLC, John Green Logistics Company, okay, but you don't know that. There's no signage for the public to even identify who's in, in that other suite. So we felt the best way to try to do that is to have space for both. If you keep it rounded, okay, all right, the lab core fits fine, but then it shrinks because it's rounded. It shrinks the name where you almost couldn't identify it from the road anyways if it was depth there. So we thought increase the sign to the minimum amount that you need it. And that was to square off the edges and go two inches taller, and that would provide adequate to uh, uh, adequate room for both of the suites to be properly identified from the road. Um, if you look at, at some of the uh, pictures that were in, in there, there was two restrictions on this site that were very important to consider. One was parking, because we don't have a parking space to give, okay, or, or we'd be in violation there. The other is, when this thing was established uh, back in 1985, nice big oak trees were, were planted. So we could move the sign into one of those things, but we're, you know, to get the electrical there and the base, we're gonna tear up root systems, we're gonna do that. We felt that wasn't the right answer either, okay? And in fact, what staff has pointed out is that how important that the uh, Garden Street Corridor is. And, and if you drive up and down the Garden Street Corridor and you look at Mr. Green's development there, it's those oaks that really set this site aside from other sites because he, he has maintained that. These are good, healthy oaks. You can move that sign anywhere in that front in between where the oaks are. It's still the same circumstances because that's all parking right there. There's no nothing set back further to get it back to the 10 feet. Uh, so, you know, I, the, the only thing that, that um, we're concerned about is this decorative strip or, you know, that staff admits sort of, we don't really know what that means, although they gave some pictures, you know, that, that's sort of something that's in the eye of the beholder. We would like the variance without any conditions, okay? And, and so today I went around and, and actually drove, drove the uh, corridor I want to look at some of the signs that were in the current corridor. And if you look, you, you look at, at what most of these signs look like and they sort of look like what we're proposing. Okay, I, I don't know that I would call anything on these, these things really decorative. In fact, the, the most current new sign, because I thought, well, let's look at the, most, the newest sign on Garden Street that we have and see how decorative that is. Well, that would be Cumberland Farms. 
And to me, that, that's not that decorative either. It's not much different than what we're proposing. Um, so we, we would like for the board just to consider this and, and move forward with the variance at the minimum amount to be able to advertise two units in one suite, protect the trees, protect the parking, and keep this building. Uh, it's a nice looking building. It's one of the nicer looking buildings on, on Garden Street. Uh, there's no outdoor display of any type. So it's a very clean site, good looking building. And this is just gonna properly advertise both suites from the road. That's clear. The sign's been there for 30 plus years. The foundation is staying. We're not moving the chain. We're just changing the top. That's all we're doing. So if, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you all may have, uh, but we would appreciate your support tonight. Uh, will this be a solid sign or a lit sign or anything yes, on the it inside? Does, it is lit. Okay. It's not. Uh, it's not a message board. It's not a message but it board. It is back backlit. Okay, so there'll be lighting on the inside yeah, to show. There, like there's the currently letters. electrical out there, but the electrical is shining lights up at the sign instead of uh, From backlit. The end, instead of being backlit. Okay. Right. So, like on our page 36, where it shows JGLC, and then it would say Lab Core underneath. Right. I assume. Yeah, or right. one, one, one of those orders anyway. Right. All right. But using maintaining the same base size. I'm sorry? Maintaining the same base size that is there now. Yeah. Yes, on both sides. And, and really, the, it's what's causing the problem is going from rounded to square and two inches taller. Okay. Are there other questions? I see a light. Yes? It... Uh, it would be important to know that specifically the difference in the size of the signs because the code tells you that your landscaped area around the base of the sign is supposed to be equal to the face of the sign. So that's going to be an important aspect. We're not changing. The landscaping staying. We're not removing any of the landscaping or the bushes. I understand. When you increase the size of the, of the, the face of the sign, then the landscape area needs to increase uh, proportionally because... According to the code, the landscape area shall be at least as large as the face of the sign. So, and it's probably that that way now. But you do need that calculation. Okay. You do need to show it. We'll be happy to do that if that's what's required by the code to plant a little bit more, put some flowering flowers around it or whatever. We'd rather do that than make put some decorative thing on on, on the sign. So, if I can also add, um, in looking at this sign that has been there since 1985. And in, in that time, the uh, downtown mixed use uh, aspect of the future land uh, use map was developed. And the DMU zone is two lots over from where, you, where your property is. So given that and that the sign setback in that area is zero, it, it, literally you can have a, have a sign directly on the, on the sidewalk or right up to it without any setback. I don't see where this is a problem for, for me, anyway. Right. So. From, Any other, uh, you have a question? Yes, sir. Uh, just from the illustration, uh, it appears that the extent of the new sign doesn't exceed the, the, found, the current uh, foundation that it sets on, yeah, it, the it, old sign. It, it, the, the base is going to remain the same, and right. the sign sits in the you same do. footprint. Uh, it might be a little out, but it's not wider than the base at all. Right. Okay, so okay. it stays within that base area. So I think that takes care of your landscape issue, I believe. Uh, Was, you know, and, and Mr. Wills, I know, knows the code very well when it comes to sign, uh, yeah. signs. Um, it, it, I don't know if, it, if it's based on the face or based on the, the base width, but wherever it is, we'll be happy to do and meet the landscape code. Uh, based based on, on what the code currently says. We have no problem doing that. Other questions? Thank you very much. Appreciate it, sir. Do I have any other cards for this agenda item? No, sir. Very well. Then we will close the public hearing and bring it back to the committee. Uh, is there any further questions of staff? If anyone has a concern or question since hearing from the, the applicant? All right. 
Do you make a motion? Very good, sir. Thank you. I'll make a motion to approve um, the uh, variance number 11 2019 um, as requested. We have a motion. Do I have a second? I'll second. All right, we have a second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, may we have a roll call, please? Chairman Taylor? Yes. Vice Chairman Shahayad? Yes. Member Johnson? Yes. Member Wheelis? Yes. Alternate Member Mandermat? Yes. Very well. So that's taken Thank care you. of. Thank you, sir. All right, let's go back to what page was that? Three? Three or two, here we go. All right, next item on the agenda is variance number 12 2019. Uh, SEC SR50 on Helen Keller. I, if you'll tell us what that all stands for, sir. Um, this is variance number 12. This is for a vacant piece of property at the north, I'm scared, the southeast corner of Helen Hauser Road and Cheney Highway. This is immediately west of 95. So the staff report begins on page 53 of your packet. The, uh, Kimberly Horn uh, is the uh, organization, or I'm sorry, the company that submitted the application on behalf of HDG Hotels of Titusville, LLC. The variance is requested, or there are two requests here. Um, the first is to section 30-332 of the code required landscape yard to allow a reduced landscape yard. And in fact, they're actually asking for a zero landscape yard there. And also to section 30-335, description of landscape yards to allow no landscaping. So approval of the first variance would probably make the second variance moot. But if you approve the first variance with even just a few feet left, then they probably still need to deal with the second variance, which is allowing for landscaping in there or not. I hope you, so we can, we can discuss that later when you get to that point. Um, the property has a commercial high intensity future land use. The property is zoned tourist the surrounding zoning on the property is primarily also tourist, with the exception of a regional commercial zoning on the north side, immediately across the street on 50th uh, Cheney Highway. The property is about has about 190 feet of frontage on Helen Hauser Road. Um, the property is vacant commercial, according to the property appraiser. I've already met or uh, summarized the criteria for you to consider when, when you consider each of these variance requests. So I'll go ahead and jump into the analysis on the bottom of page 54. So currently we have a site plan that's in review for a new restaurant. The property is um, at this location and th I believe this is an out parcel of a larger development there. <coughs> on page 55 of your packet, I'll begin there on the staff report. The parcel appears to have been created out of a larger tract of land that includes the Quality Inn Hotel, which is located at 3655 Cheney Highway. The staff was unable to locate a cross-access agreement for the shared driveway, which is, happens to be located on the south part of this vacant piece of property where this landscape yard is supposed to be. This, being, this is going to be rectified during the site development review process. On section 30-332 of the code specifies the types of landscape yards, whether they should be 10 feet wide or, or 20 feet deep. And then section 30-335 uh, of the code specifies the type and amount of vegetation that's required in those landscape yards. The, re the proposed restaurant is required to have a 10-foot landscape yard at the south property line. The applicant is requesting a variance to that and also requesting variance to the to having no landscaping in that area. The landscape plan submitted with the variance application proposes to relocate the required landscaping that otherwise would be required in that south area to another area of the property, primarily adjacent to State Road 50, due to the location of the shared access driveway, which currently exists in the south portion of this property for, other, for others to access the hotel. Um, it appears to be a special, there appears to be a special circumstance that is not the result of the actions of the applicant. The relocation of the required vegetation also appears to meet the intent and spirit of the code. So based on that, staff recommends approval of the variances on the condition 
that the equivalent number of required landscaping that otherwise is required in that south landscape yard be relocated to another area of the site. The variance is the minimum which makes reasonable use of the property. Special conditions on the property are not the result of the actions of the applicant and relocating the landscape into another area of the property meets the intent and spirit of the ordinance. With that, I'm gonna point out uh, the exhibits. On page 65 of your packet, you will see the survey of the property. You can see the boundaries of this property are immediately adjacent to existing parking spaces, which are associated with the neighboring hotel. On page 66, you'll see the proposed restaurant. It is a fast food restaurant with a drive through um, And there is an existing driveway on the south end of the property there. On page 67 is a, an illustration of the vegetation that would be planted on the property, provided this variance is, re, is approved. The applicant uh, today did send me, send to me another exhibit similar to this. I have not verified whether it is different from this particular image you see here. I believe when the applicant is, uh, will be available to speak or answer any questions, they will have another image available on the screens here for you to look at. But we believe that um, approval of this variance it meets the intent of the code. We did not work with the applicant to determine where exactly the, that vegetation should go. We believe that can be determined and resolved during the site plan process. On page 75 of your packet, you'll see the aerial. And you can see that part of an existing driveway does exist on the <coughs> south part of that vacant piece of property. On page 76 of your packet, I've included the sections of the code that are relevant here. So I've included on page 67, or excuse me, 76 of your packet, a table that's part of section 30-332 of the code. And this tells us if your property is gonna be a commercial use next to another commercial use, then there's a type A buffer required. Type A buffer is described in another section of the code further down on page 78 of your packet as a 10 foot wide landscape strip with, and then it also identifies what type of vegetation should be in that buffer. This is what the applicant is requesting a variance to, these two sections of the code. The code, I do want to point out on page 80 of your packet, there is an exhibit from the code, a map there, that shows that there are certain arterials inside the city that have a much more stringent and, and larger buffer requirement along those right-of-ways. So, for example, along 50th Street, Cheney Highway, there is a requirement for a 30-foot landscape buffer along there. I believe the applicant is proposing that. That would have to be, their they will deal with that during the site plan review. So there's certainly enough room there to, for additional landscaping if landscaping is going to be moved from the south part of the property to the north. With that, I'll try and answer any questions, and I know the applicant is also here. Uh, representatives from Kimberly Horn are also here to answer any questions. I'm having a little hard time looking at this uh, site plan. Um, when I look at the plan, is there going to be a sidewalk on Helen Hauser? Uh, is that just greenery, or is there a sidewalk, or, uh, or am I seeing a sidewalk? I mean, I, I can't tell where all the trees are. That is a, side. Is that a, is side. a si yes, that is a there, sidewalk. There will be a sidewalk there. Yes. Okay, just, yeah. I noticed a lot of traffic just walking because of all the hotels. They, that would be nice. There's not one at this present time, I don't believe, a sidewalk. I do not believe so. Yeah. All right. Are there other questions of staff anyone else has? Um, Brad, you were saying that uh, there is enough room to uh, put the additional landscaping required for the south side of the property or the west side of the property that they can put it on the north side? We believe so. Uh, the additional 10 feet, right now there is a Typically on our front, on our right-of-ways, there is a 20-foot uh, requirement. 
and along 50, and so there's a standard amount of landscaping there. And if you add additional 10 feet to that, the standard, the number of landscaping is still the same. So if you move the landscaping is required from the, from the south part of the property to this north part of the property, we don't think there would be an issue there. Are you requiring one to one, like whatever is required on the south side, on the west side, you're going to put it on the north? So, yeah. Or in something in workable in with, the, with the staff? In essence, you would see a double amount of vegetation on the north side, if that's how they want to do it. We're not recommending a condition to limit them just to move that vegetation only to the north side, just anywhere else on the property as well. So that can include the landscape strips that are required on the east and the west sides as well, anywhere else internal on the property as well. Yeah, on the east side, you have a tremendous amount of landscaping between the property line and the DOT right away. And that's very, very um, heavily vegetated there. Yes. So, so the only place is on the north side. That prevents from people on lookers, you know, coming down on State Road 50. They want to see this place. Uh, I and try would, to move into it. I would defer to the applicant. I believe this image here on page 70, 67 of your packet is an illustration of meeting that intent. Okay. So I, I would defer to the applicant to answer that question. But that's something that we would deal with definitely during the second okay. language. Other than that, I don't have any. Okay. Anyone else have a question of staff? All right. Seeing none, we'll open it up to our public hearing at this time. And who is our first applicant, please? Mackenzie Surgeon. All right. Would you come join with us with your name and address, please, ma'am? Good evening. Mackenzie Surgeon, 445 24th Street, Vero Beach, Florida. So I uh, just wanted to touch on the main reasons for this variance was because of the existing driveway that was brought, that is there currently to serve the hotel property to the south. Um, it's in page 67 of the packet, but just to have the documentation here printed out a little larger to see. This is essentially an illustration showing the house that was So the yellow color depicts the trees and the shrubs that are supposed to be along the southern property line that we cannot locate there due to the dry aisle that encroaches into the property. We do have three trees and all of the required shrubs located on the southern property line next to the dumpster. And then the remaining four trees are up in the north where we have a larger landscaped area. We do not want to comply with the southern buffer because that would remove the existing access to the hotel. Their driveway would be difficult to shift to the south because their property has a lift station immediately south of the road. Plus they would, this keeping the driveway here would allow them to maintain their access as it currently is and has been. This variance application requests no reduction in landscape trees or shrubs. All of the trees and understory trees are still being met elsewhere on the site. If there are any questions, I will take them now. Thank you. Um, so you are compensating for the, um, for the landscape, the one that's supposed to be on the west side? Yes. Okay. And you passed it through staff and it's okay, right? Okay. No more questions. Anyone else have a question of this witness? Wow, you're getting off white. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Do I have any other uh, cards on this variance? No, sir. Well, in that case, case, we'll close the public hearing and bring it back to the board. Are there any further questions of staff anyone has? Make a motion. I'd uh, be glad to have one. <laughs> I'll make a motion to uh, approve um, variance number 12 2019 um, with the uh, staff recommendation. All right, I have a motion. Do I have a second? Yeah, I'll second. 
Okay. All right. May we have roll call, please? Member Wheelis? Yes. Member Johnson? Yes. Alternate Member Mandernack? Yes. Chairman Taylor? Yes. Vice Chairman Shahayev? Yes. Okay. So that is approved. Congratulations. I know some people are looking forward to the restaurant that's coming, which wasn't named tonight, but I've heard rumors. So. <laughs> All right. Uh, it's on the other side of the interstate, though. I don't know if I'll make it there. So. Okay, uh, back to the top again. All right, next up, we have variance number 13-2019. This is a request from Temple Baptist Church about a grease trap. I think this is our first grease trap hearing we've had, so should be interesting. All right, staff, tell us all about grease traps. So variance number 13 is for a property located at 1400 North Washington Avenue. At also, this is the Temple Baptist um, Church. The staff report begins on page 85, 85 of your packet. The applicant, Lou Smith, on behalf of Temple Baptist Church of Titusville, owner submitted this request. This is specifically a variance request to sections of the Code of Ordinances, not the Land of the Code. Code of Ordinances 21-240A, so par paragraph one and two. One relates to grease interceptors requirements are to utilize an existing internal grease trap interceptor that is smaller than the required 750 gallon capacity external <coughs> grease trap interceptor. And the applicant is requesting that the existing grease trap that's located on the property internal to a building there be approved in lieu of the required 750 gallon capacity external grease trap. The second variance is to the requirement that the grease trap be external. The location of the property again is at 1400 North Washington Avenue. The, the future land use according to the future land use comp, uh, element of the comprehensive plan is public semi-public. The zoning is general use. The surrounding zoning on the property is mixed Titusville and county zoning. To the north, there is Brevard County multifamily and agricultural type zonings. To the south, there is the city's hospital medical zoning. To the east, there's the city's commercial and light industrial services and warehousing M1 zoning, which is across the street from US1. And then immediately to the west, there's Brevard County's agricultural zoning district. The lot characteristics, the property is approximately 18 plus acres with 900 plus feet of linear frontage on North Washington Avenue. The use on the property is a church with ancillary school that occupies the property. Again, I will not go over the variance criteria that you'll consider with each variance request. Uh, the analysis begins on page 87. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to the uh, Ashley Smith and to Yvette, uh, excuse me, uh, with water resources. I've written a slightly shorter and more brief summary than the full analysis that's in your report. Um, a brief history is that a site development application was submitted for the purposes of connecting the church to the city sewer system. During the review, the applicant requested relief from the grease interceptor requirement. Staff determined that a variance was required. The analysis done by staff has two parts. The first analyzes the variance required for consistency with code. The second part discusses the impacts to public health and the environment, which are the basis for the city code. For the first part, the section of the code that pertains to fats, oils, and grease to the public sanitary sewer system is section 21-76 to section 21-240. And your report is a digest of the code and our standard detail. Under section 21-76, the applicant's facility falls into two defined categories for food service establishments. Those two categories are church kitchens and schools. Based on that, the code applies directly to the applicant's land use. Under section 21-240A1, Food service facilities are required to install an external grease trap with a minimum size of 750 gallon capacity. In addition, section 21 240A2, 
further stipulates that existing owners are required to install such external grease traps and the only factor that makes use of an internal interceptor acceptable would be an insufficient amount of space, along with the size of the facility for the installation of an external grease trap as specified. Staff has concluded that the applicant has sufficient space to install an external grease trap with a minimum size of 750 gallons as specified by code. As a result, the applicant's request is not consistent with city code. The second part impacts on public health and environment. The grease trap code is important to the city's sanitary sewer system and to our community on the Indian River Lagoon. This code safeguards public health and environmental impacts. The applicant's 59 gallon grease trap is 8% of the minimum size of city code standards. Although it, it has mentioned in the report that only two inches of grease is in the device, it is likely more grease has been washed through the device due to its size. Grease is washed through due to heat, detergents, and flow. The city's code minimally sized device being 750 gallons is to allow for water carrying fats, oils, and greases to hold in the tank. The tank allows the greases to cool, thus allowing them to be more solid and settle to the bottom. It also allows for higher volumes of water to collect as the device is bigger, which prevents greases from being washed through due to flows and detergents in the water. So the size of the device is independent of how often the kitchen is used. In addition, grease removal devices are typically designed on capacity or potential of the discharger, not current use. Since the applicant falls into church, kitchen, and school, there is the potential for larger amounts of fats, oils, and greases in the future. From a public health standpoint, external devices are more sanitary for removal of grease. Haulers of grease may also empty things like septic tanks and um, portable toilets. So having a device emptied inside a facility could cause contamination. The treatment program by the city code protects both the city's sanitary sewer system and the Indian River Lagoon. Excess grease in sewer pipes can lead to clogs, which may result in failing pipes and cause a sewage spill. In addition, excess grease at our wastewater plant has a negative effect in our treatment processes. If our treatment processes cannot effectively treat the wastewater through biological nutrient removal, then nitrogen and phosphorus levels could be higher. Nitrogen and phosphorus levels directly impact the Indian River Lagoon and the city, along with the surrounding communities, continually work to reduce nitrogen and phosphorus levels. Grease is also the main cause of odor issues at reclamation facilities, so the code works to reduce those odors experienced at our facilities. Lastly, the city required grease interceptor does provide a benefit to applicants. Once installed, the applicant has the flexibility to increase their food service without the need for a larger device. We have seen this provide a real estate value to other properties. By enforcing this code to each case, we are collectively benefiting the city sewer system infrastructure, treatment system, and the Indian River Lagoon. And after that, I will read the recommendation from staff. The re recommendation from staff is to deny the requested variances and require the applicant route all food service area plumbing fixture drains to an exterior grease interceptor with a minimum capacity of 750 gallons meeting the city water resources department specifications in accordance with city code section 21-240. All interior plumbing work shall comply with Florida building code and bathroom waste must be excluded from the grease device. There are no special circumstances which exist that are peculiar to the land structure or building involved and which are not applicable to other land structures or building in the same zoning. Granting the variance will confer upon the applicant a special privilege that is denied by the ordinance to other lands, buildings, or structures in the same zoning district. The literal interpretation of the provisions of the ordinance would not deprive the applicant of rights commonly enjoyed by other properties in the same zoning district under the terms of the ordinance. The granting of the variance will not per persevere preserve the spirit of the ordinance and remain in harmony with its general purpose and intent. Thank you. Um, I do want to take over from there. I just want to point out to you a few exhibits um, in your packet. 
Um, and to also just to inform you that this all started with a request for um, connection to the city's sewer system. Um, and so that, that's what triggered this. And they have actually submitted to, the applicant submitted to us a site plan that's under review right now. And that's what triggered this need for a variance, this request from them. So the exhibits that are, I want to point out to you is on page 105 of your packet. This is something that was pulled directly from the site plan application. And it shows the um, an exhibit from the site plan that illustrates uh, how they will connect to the city sewer. And then you'll also see the location, which may be a little hard for you to see actually, on the west part, just west of the build, building number three, there is a label there that, talk, that indicates that there will be a 750 gallon grease interceptor. And this is what the applicant is requesting a waiver from. Is that correct? Did I? Yes. Okay. Um, we did include the, the, leg, the section of the code that Ashley alluded to on page 108 of, the, of your packet. You'll see, um, beginning on 108 of your packet, you'll see a definition there for food service establishments def uh, highlighted there on page 109 of your packet. And I don't know, we want to read that for the record or? Okay, go ahead. Food service establishment shall mean a commercial facility primarily engaged in preparing, serving, or otherwise making available for consumption foodstuffs by the public, such as, but not limited to, restaurants, commercial kitchens, cafeterias, nightclubs, delicacies, <coughs> meat cutting preparations, bakeries, bagel shops, grocery stores, caterers, hotels, schools, church kitchens, convenience stores, park fraternal organization kitchens, and hospitals. And then finally, just so you're aware here, there is, we also included the section 21-240, paragraph A, one and two. Those are the two sections that they're asking variances for. That's on page 110 of your packet. And that's directly from, this is the section of the code that's being asked to be waived from. Paragraph one, again, is the required grease trap size. And then paragraph two is where it should be located, external to the buildings. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I, believe, I believe that's it, unless there's anything else that I've missed. Okay. So I think with that, we'll try and answer any questions you have about this variance. And I, the applicants are here to answer any questions as well. So looking at number one under that 21-240 where it states all newly constructed facilities because they're requesting sewer services, you consider this a new facility? No, we would not consider it a new facility, but under section two, it gives the requirement for existing facilities. Section one is just to indicate the city's minimum size although it references new facilities in that section too. Okay. Your biggest, I'm sorry, can I? Yes, please. The biggest difficulty I have with this is just uh, the uh, plumbing inside the building. You know, is it directly from the kitchen out or the whole plumbing including all the sanitary inside the building go to one place and then go outside the building towards the uh, septic field, basically. That's where um, they probably, if he, there's one septic field or two, three septic fields that have to be abandoned. You the know? applicant would have to answer how many septic fields there are. Sorry, there was one other exhibit that we forgot to include. The applicant provided to us it illustrates the existing grease trap, and we handed that to you as a hard copy. And so uh, I apologize, I did not include that in the packet for you, but you should have it there on the dais for you. Any other questions of staff? Yeah, was there any suggestion of where the grease trap is going to go, you know, on this? I mean, if we put the one grease trap, is every single, um, like, um, 
clean out outside has to go out into the grease a new grease trap like there's two three places where the water where the where the sanitary flows do you know the location on the grease um, interceptor on the site plan was provided by their engineer there could be flexibility of its location external of buildings but we only we would have the kitchen grease go to the grease interceptor so I'm not a hundred percent sure if that's right there by building three or if that's in a different okay. building so building three is the only grease trap that we we are asking for all we're asking is for a grease trap for their kitchen the wherever kitchen that only. may be located okay. mm -hmm. just the kitchen yeah. mm -hmm. okay. any other questions all right in that case we'll open it up to the public and may we have the first card please lou smith Mr. Smith, if you come forward and please give us your name and address for the record, sir. Welcome. Uh, name is Lou Smith, and uh, I'm sorry, what else did you need? Uh, your address. Personal address? Yes, sir. 2513 Dorothy Circle, Titusville. Thank you. 32780. Uh, I'm sure you're going to have some questions. Uh, along with my card there is our pastor and our uh, contractor that's going to work on that's working on the project with us so I don't know if you want to bring them up now or we do this one at a time or how we exactly want to we have no objection to how they may have several people on, on as an applicant to be able to right. speak all right as long as we can get their name on the record first you know come on up and enter your name and give us the who you are, please. Yes, sir. I'm uh, Tom Porter, pastor at Temple Baptist Church. My address is 3460 Trevino Circle, Titusville, Florida. Thank you. Yes, sir. You're the pastor. All right. And I'm William Buckman, ASAP on site septic and sewer. We're going to be doing the contract for the putting in the lift stations and the stuff with the new improvements. And uh, they asked me to be here in case there's any questions I can be involved in. All right, sir. And I didn't hit your title. Is I'm a trustee. At the You're one of the trustees yes. for the church. Very good, sir. Yes. If I may. Our, yes, please. We, we're hoping to have this grandfathered in. I certainly understand both sides of the, of the uh, situation, if you want to call it that. Our, our existing grease trap has worked proficiently for 34 years, ever since it's been in existence. Um, uh, we do know... Uh, Frying, we have no fryers there. We, we have no commercial uh, dishwasher there. Uh, uh, we use paper products, plates, and so forth. Uh, as being a church, as you know, most of the meals are covered dish when people come in. KSC does all our frying for us. So we, um, uh, it's very minimal. We do have uh, 38 lunches we prepare for our prime timers. That's a citywide um, senior adult program that we do uh, every, every, uh, every Tuesday. And, uh, but we don't fry anything for them either. We stick to things like, um, you know, uh, spaghetti and baked chicken and things like that. And what grease that generates is put in a canister and disposed of. It doesn't go into the, uh, the grease trap. Our school students, they all bring their lunches. We don't, we don't prepare lunches for them. They'll, if they need to heat anything up, they would do that by microwave. Um, and so, it's very minimal that what we do as far as producing uh, any grease that would go into our grease trap. Um, and then lastly, I'd like to just say, as a pastor, we're called upon many times, especially because of the size of our church, uh, to host, uh, if there's any first responders, uh, a funeral for them. Uh, we just had one for a uh, fireman just uh, a couple of weeks ago. And the families want to use the kitchen uh, for a place to meet, not to cook. They bring the food in. But to have our kitchen shut down, and I'm not really sure how long that would be, but to have our, our kitchen shut down, it would shut down our school for uh, eating purposes. They'd have to eat in the classrooms or someplace else um, outside. And it would cut out being able to facilitate any needs that we have for uh, the Titus Fire Department or the Police Department or the Bard County Sheriff's Department uh, because they, they want to use our building because of the size. So uh, that's just from a pastor's heart. That's just, I hate to see us have to shut down for uh, whatever period of time it is. We have waited over a year on this project and we still don't have a permit on it. That's, I've been told that's coming in a few weeks. Um, 
And so that's 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 where we're at. And I'm just uh, that's my story. <laughs> yes, sir. Any direct questions from the pastor? May I say something? Yes, please. We work, um, you know, with uh, with uh, you know switching from septic system to public system all the time, and this is very, 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 very good thing you're doing. Okay, now the uh, just to, you know connecting to the public system, which yes, is sir, really good. Yes, and uh, the grease trap is really, really important to have from a kitchen that it generates any grease. Because they have a tremendous amount of problem at the lift at the at the treatment plant, and that's the reason they bring it up. Now, you you said you had a grease trap inside the building. That's right. It's in the floor. Right. In the floor. Yes, sir. And it works just fine. Yeah. Yes, sir. I mean, it's a 59-gallon tank, and there's maybe right now over a two-year period probably two inches of grease in there because not they just don't generate yeah. grease. Yeah. But, yeah, and I think the, the staff has a certain rules. I, I think they go with, and that's why they like a bigger grease trap placed outside, uh, and you know that that will dissipate some of the some of the problems that they are facing at the at the treatment plant. But um, but what you're doing is a, is a great job, and uh, sometimes too, you know, I'm not sure if the if you're working with an architect. Did you, have you worked? Are you working with the architect too on this? Are you making the grease trap any bigger inside the building? Are we making it any bigger inside the building? Inside yes, the building, inside like the, uh, like you, you have a small grease trap right now, right? Yes, sir. Well, you're gallons. not changing it now, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, that's it. I don't have any other questions. <laughs> I, I have yes, a, go ahead. I, for the collective. Uh, The requirement to have an external means that that will become the prime place to collect and the interior one will no longer be used? Is that is that how that works? The interior one would be removed, so there would only be an external device. And it has to be removed? Could it just be cleaned and left in place? I mean, would, would that alleviate the problem of having to close up the facility if it's just uh, What I'm referring abandoned? to is when they come in and do the construction and, and for the external tank that's out there, uh, they're going to have to tear up the floor in order to run the lines to that external tank is my understanding. Am I right on that, Bill? Yeah. There is an please, please come up to the mic, please, sir. Okay. Speak. It, it, it is an in-ground grease trap, and they do have in-ground grease traps, and they still put them in in a lot of different places for different sizes, different because you, you have some paper product, people that use only use paper, some do dishes, and it all comes in different sizes. And I understand the rules in Titusville is that you have to have a 750 gallon grease trap in the ground, but this one is it has been already put in years ago, 1985, maybe? 84, 84. And it was put in the ground in the kitchen, and all of the, the floor drains and the and the sinks and everything goes into the grease trap, and then it ties back into the sewer. So in order to put it outside, you got to come in and take the one out of the ground, take all these pipes, tie them back into a main pipe that'll go out the south end of the building around to where the grease trap location is going to go by the new lift station. And it's a basically what it is. It's it's. They're trying to, the big picture, they're trying to get to sewer. They're trying to get off of the septic systems. Yes, there are multiple septic systems on the site. Mm -hmm. Some of them, and then there's all kinds of reasons and, and different reasons for different things. And a lot of them are good, but they've kind of ended up in a little bit of a hardship. And they're trying to come up with something that could maybe get them a little, but I know this is, you can't talk about yeah, that, so. Right. Uh, so, and I'll, let me be specific, we have three uh, septic systems on our property, three. The main one that is dead, and we're having to have to pump it out uh, every other week. Uh, and that, that we've been doing that for over a year. Hmm. And we've been spending, uh, and so, um, so yeah, so there's three, there's three septic systems on our property. <clears throat> Just want to make that clear. Okay. One, there's three buildings. Each building has its own septic system. Okay. 
Building was, one. Well, seeing how your building has such limited use, I mean, honestly, I mean, much where I attend church, we have a commercial kitchen. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure we have one of those larger tanks because uh, I hear stories about it getting cleaned out. <laughs> um, if you were in the future to ever have to want to upgrade your kitchen, would you understand that that means you have to go all the way up to the new code totally? C certainly. We, we, yes, sir. We understand that. So that, so if we were inclined to accept this, it would be a restriction that you stay under the same usage yes, sir. as you presently have, as a thought. But if you wanted to upgrade the kitchen, that's part of the upgrade. Yes. Just a thought. Just throwing it around, asking your thoughts about what if sure. we were inclined to go that way. Other questions of these witnesses? Well, I don't see any light. Oh, there we go. You you also serve meals to the school no, on sir. a daily basis? No, sir. They bring their lunches in. They bring their lunches. Yes, sir. They have things like hot pocket or ramen, ramen, ramen noodles, and that's all heated up by microwave. We're not preparing meals for the students. If there's something at all. brought in, be like a pizza or you know something. Like Nothing is cooked for the students. Nothing's prepared. Yeah, nothing's prepared. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, thank you, gentlemen. I don't see any other questions of you. Thank and you. I appreciate you coming up and speaking with us. Yes, sir. Do I have any other uh, cards for this particular agenda item? No, sir. All right. Okay, so at this time, we'll close the public hearing and bring it back to the board to discuss or ask questions or inquire further with staff and staff members. Could, could you talk more about the risk of the Indian River? Uh, I mean, as it is and as being recommended by staff that this would protect the Indian River, is that, I mean, is that Sure, I can elaborate on that. Um, so the focus on the Indian River Lagoon is to reduce nitrogen and phosphorus. And so our wastewater plant does that through various treatment processes. However, when grease enters into the wastewater plant, it can cause some of those treatment processes to either be inefficient or not effective <clears throat> at reducing those levels. When those levels aren't reduced, that is then part of the end product, which is reclaim water. And then we use the reclaimed water, which is how it gets to the Indian River Lagoon, if that makes sense. So you, you basically have to treat this as a restaurant does, and so restaurants have accommodations to separate gray water or sewer water from the products that, as a result of cooking. Yes. No matter how much the volume is. Yes, anytime we have a restaurant or any kind of food preparation. This new restaurant that we just talked about would have an external yes. grease trap. They have one on their site plan. Any other discussion? Yes, sir. Yes, is there a consideration for limitation of the use um, associated with this so that you can look at it as not being a uh, church kitchen is that a is that a viable aspect you as the board have the right and ability to impose conditions on a variance request whether you if you approve it um, if that's where you're going we'd certainly like to hear what your discussion would be or your concerns would be I think as I pointed out earlier when I made us the question if the usage stays the same, there's no reason to advance to the larger system, but if there was any upgrades or updates to the kitchen to become a more full kitchen, shall we say, or even any upgrades to the kitchen, I'll, I'll, put, I'll put any upgrades to the kitchen, such as commercial uh, washers or commercial fryers, et cetera, et cetera, that then you would be required to meet the code Absolutely. and uh, that would that would be my thought it would put a restriction as to keep it as is under what their present limited use yes sir yeah, so my question uh, you produced essentially uh, one inch per year over the last two years 
there's two inches of something in there. So. Yeah, yes, sir. I can't honestly. You have to sit with the podium, sir. Would you please yeah, that's fine. Would you please come to the podium? Uh, I, I could probably look at the records, go back, but I can't remember the last time we had. Um, yeah, it probably was in the past three, two to three years, we had them come out and just forsake, just clean it out. But it wasn't, it wasn't because it was plugged up. That's just healthy, healthy thing and, to do. And how many there. inches of volume can it hold? Is that a, a lot? Is two inches little or a lot? Yeah, I can't, I can't answer that, Bill. Um, Excuse me. I'm sorry. If you're going to speak, sir, you need to come up to the mic. I'm sorry. So you'd be That's here. Okay. Yeah, it would probably hold a foot, maybe, of grease. And I don't know if it's been pumped or not. You know, I really don't. I went and looked at it. It didn't have a lot of grease in there when I showed up. So, and maybe they restrict that 38 people that come once a week? No, it's 38 weeks. 38 weeks. Yes, okay. we serve it. We could prepare a meal 30 every uh, 38, 38 weeks. weeks, yes. Yeah, okay. But, I mean, maybe like, you could cater that and not do any cooking until they get to the point to where they can put in a grease trap or something. I don't know. I'm trying to make this suggestion. Well, again. to that, I mean, this is, a, this is a, something that we do for our senior adults in our okay. community, and you know, I don't want to be a burden to them anymore. Right. Okay. Yeah. But you still don't have any fryers there. No, sir. There's no commercial fryers in it. In right. So you're not. No, sir. And there's no you commercial prepare, dishwasher. So when you do prepare food, you're not doing it in mass. Well, I understand spaghetti. It's just boiling water. But you're well, there'll not, be baked chicken. There'll be maybe hot dogs sometime. I mean, yeah. Yes. But we're not doing French fries, fried chicken, fish fries, anything like that. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Okay. Appreciate your input. Uh, are there any other questions or discussion back to board members? I have a question for staff. Yes. Is the amount of grease in the trap any indication of the level of use? No, I don't think that could be quantified okay. with the level that's seen in the device. Uh, As I mentioned in the analysis, a lot could wash through. That, that was my thought. The detergents and whatnot will dissolve the grease and allow it to go on into, in this case, into the septic system. Yes. Uh, but... Uh, what we don't want is that into the commercial, uh, into the public sewer system. Yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, any further discussion? Yeah, I, I'm sensitive to the Indian River and protecting it. And that weighs heavily on my mind about how we proceed about this. Just to clarify, this doesn't go to the Indian River congestion or the same thing. Excuse me, if you could speak into the microphone. The, so, again, the, 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 uh, if you do nothing, somehow the concern is that the grease products will end up in the sewage treatment plant, which affects its ability to protect the Indian River. Yes, because it affects the, the phosphorus and nitrogen levels from being removed from the reclaim. When reclaim is applied to your lawn, um, rain and things like that will wash it to the storm system, which eventually can get to the Indian River Lagoon. And that's how, that's how phosphorus and nitrogen levels can affect, can get to the Indian River Lagoon. I understand that, but how does, how does grease get into phosphorus? And I'm not making that connection. The grease is in the wastewater, which goes to the wastewater plant the treatment processes at the wastewater plant remove phosphorus and nitrogen, but grease can make those processes ineffective or not as efficient at removing those levels. Well, if it just produces so little that it's almost ingestible places, I would... I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. Did you get... I was just thinking that, I mean, if they produce an inch every year, and I, I don't, I'm not sure, but it sounds like it's, uh, it's not a lot. Yeah, the, the level of the grease that's on top of an inadequate grease trap, which that's a very small grease trap. If you, 
if you use hot water and detergent, it will flush out. The grease accumulates at the top. It doesn't settle to the bottom. It accumulates at the top. And if you're using hot water and detergent, it's making everything very tiny and it washes right by the system and would go into their drain field, which is, you know, is that the reason why their drain field is having a problem? We don't know. But do we want to take that risk of it upsetting the plant? Because, yes, the nitrogen and phosphorus is very bad for the Indian River, but grease is terrible for the whole process of dealing with our biological waste at the wastewater treatment plant. It can make the plant shut down. I mean, it can, it can do that. And we don't know how much grease is collected. If, it ha if the grease tramp that they have hasn't been emptied in a couple of years, it doesn't mean that it's not collecting grease. It means that they're not paying attention to their unit. But the, but the grease that's in it, mm -hmm. the way it's configured, goes to a field. Right now it's going to a drain field. To a drain field that ends up in the drain field. but. In the modifications that you're doing, it's going to be reconfigured so it, the the existing grease trap will empty into the sewage system. Is that not the existing one? The new one would empty into the, the sewage system. The existing, if the board elected for their existing to be used, it would go to their proposed lift stations, which would go into the sewer system. If a new one is installed, that would also go to the lift stations, which go, goes to the sewer system. In either case. If I could just ask Yvette to introduce herself and her title and your number of years of experience in this industry as you're a new member of staff. I don't know that the board properly had your title heard at the beginning Thank of you. this item. My name is Yvette Fliss. I'm the pre-treatment coordinator for the city of Titusville. I am new with this city, but I have over 10 years of experience doing this at other cities in Brevard County. Okay. From what you just said, are you saying that in either case, unmodified but the the final plan is the if it's left as it is it will connect to the sewer system the new external will also connect to the sewer system in either scenario the interceptor if the existing or the new would have to connect to the, to the sewer system so how does either of these prevent some harm of not maintaining or cleaning prevent it from harming the Indian River. The city of Titusville standard is a much larger device which allows water to collect in the device, allowing that grease to settle to the bottom where it can then be taken out of the tank. Their current device is so small, there's a high per chance that it's passing through the device and not settling to the bottom. If I may, this is not a new requirement. This is this is a requirement that's been in effect for at least 10 years that I'm, I'm aware of. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, and we've seen any number of small mom and pop type restaurants have to go through this same process. And it's while it is cumbersome and it is expensive and it is not a fun fun thing to happen, it is something that is necessary. Um, just one observation. Uh, the city codes uh, in this regard, <clears throat> I'm certain, were modeled uh, as a best practice from industry. In other words, this wasn't something, just as a point of clarification, um, that, that the city just didn't decide on 750 gallons. These things are industry practice. Yes, and this is similar to other cities. No, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Uh, <laughs> we'll turn the light off. Okay. Well, we're back before us then. The applicant does have an opportunity for rebuttal if he'd like to add something else. It looks like he does. Yeah. Very good, sir. Please right, just for, come back to the mic, please. Just for clarification, uh, the septic tank that is no longer functioning properly is not connected to our kitchen. That's to our sanctuary, the first building. So the, build, the septic tank system in building three with the, with the grease trap is, is functioning well. 
Second of all, I may have misspoke. I was brought to my attention. That, that's 38 Tuesdays in a year. So that's 38 days total that we prepare a meal for our senior adults. That's one Tuesday for 38 weeks. Okay, not 38 weeks we do that. Just, yeah, and I may have said it that way. I was brought to my attention, so. All right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Before you, before you go, I just did I answer that question? Yes, sir. Uh, the cost of your system, the, uh, the um, lift stations that you're putting in and the connection to the city, um, could you give us an approximate figure? Like, Yes, sir. I, I can do that. I was told that we're, that was not to be spoken about. Just the cost oh, it's not? Budget. Okay. All right. So I'm trying to honor that. No, no but problem. But there's a reason we're here. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Well, we've heard discussion, we've heard from the applicants, we've heard from staff. So, does anyone wish to make a comment further or make a motion, please? I will turn my light off. Um, if, if I may, before you make your motion, um, sometimes the applicant, you might want to consider asking the applicant if they see that the uh, direction of this is probably not going to go their way or there, there's a, that you might want to ask them to maybe reconsider to either remove, withdraw the application, maybe modify it or um, ask it for it to be tabled for us to work with the, app, the staff in a, in a different direction in some way. I'm not sure what direction that would be. But that's something I would, I would suggest that maybe you could ask the applicant, because once your decision is rendered, it's final. And I think the applicant needs to be aware of that. All right, Connor, you please come back up, sir. You've heard some staff input there. Yes, sir. About either having a decision tonight, one, or, one way or the other, or asking for a continuance to be tabled so that you can work with staff a lot further to see if there's some other workarounds or some other possibilities. How would that fit into your scheme of things? We, we would be open to that. All right. Okay. Thank you. You would? He said would. Yes. We would. Yes, sir. Okay. We would be open okay. to that. We're, Thank you. We're not, we're not angry, but it's, it is a, uh, it is a financial, it's, it's a high ticket item. Yes. yes. Sir. We yeah, understand. All right. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. Well, do I have a... One thing I, I asked to the question before is just a comparison between what the grease trap is going to cost compared to the overall construction. Right. No, that's the only reason I asked that question. Oh, no, it's okay. That's all right. We don't, we don't need it. We well, let staff work on that. So, yeah. all so right. I, if yes. I may, is that the applicant withdrawing your application or asking no. you to table it? Or? He, he, or to go He's forward. open to having tabled so that he can work with you some more. Okay, we don't. We've worked with the applicant as far as we think we can. That's why we're here tonight. Uh, so, if there's a direction from the board to help us with that discussion, that's what we would ask for you. If if you do that. Oh, okay. There isn't any. Um, I mean, basically, the, the, I mean, the, the, there is a kitchen, and there isn't any any. Um, you know, going back and forth, you know, either either there is a septic or there is a uh, grease trap or there isn't, right. you know, there's no, there, yeah. That's kind of the way I'm seeing it too, unfortunately, because it, I mean, it, you've got to have one and um, I mean, and that's one of the reasons I was curious about whether 750 gallons was a, was a. That's the minimum problem, most it, likely yeah, that's the minimum that, required by the city, so. Right. So, okay. But if, if I may, what, what I mean, what is to clarify, if it comes back, if they, they're going to withdraw it or table it for, with direction for you to work with staff further, just say, you know, there's no flex, we don't have any further flexibility with it. Our minimum standard is what we have, and that's why we're here tonight. Okay. Okay, so well, they've, had, they've had their discussions between the staff and. Their members, so 
it's up to us to decide whether they keep her or not. So, um, I guess the this was the question for the applicant: for if were they to uh, withdraw this as staff suggested, um, it doesn't result in a final decision, um, and it does allow you the opportunity. We appreciate that. We just will go with whatever decision you all make tonight. Thank you. Okay. Well, I guess I'll have to make a motion to deny the variance. Um, uh, 13-2019. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second that motion. Okay. We've had a motion and a second. Any other discussion among the members? All right. May we have roll call, please? Member Johnson? Yes. Member Wheelis? Yes. Vice Chairman Shahan? Yes. Alternate Member Mandernak? Yes. Chairman Taylor? Yes. All right. Thank you very much for coming and maybe working with staff for other, yes, other matters. Yes, Thank you. Yes, All right, now back to page two. Do, 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 do. What's up next? Okay, bringing us down to our final item tonight. Uh, we have an appeal at this point. Uh, appeal number two, 2019. The address for the appeal is 1190 Queen Street. So staff, if you would enlighten us, please. So this application, you don't receive very many appeals. This is an appeal of an administrative interpretation of the code, the administrator being the director of the community development department who is responsible for implementing the land development regulations. This appeal is the second one of this year, and this is specific to uh, 1190 Queen Street. The staff report begins on page 115 of your packet. The applicant, Mr. Jason Lawson, on behalf of Lawson Masonry and Construction Company Incorporated, uh, owns the property 1190 Main Street. The property, or Queen Street, excuse me, the property has a zoning designation of multifamily high density, or R3, which primarily allows residential uses only. Uh, the only non-residential uses that are, that are allowed in there are things like a church or other community centers or things of that nature. So what we have here is a uh, construction business at this location that's a grandfathered or basically a non-conforming use at this location. So the administrative interpretation is such. The lack of a current BTR, business tax receipt, for the Lawson Masonry Construction Company for over six years and the lack of water service for approximately four years supports the conclusion that there has not been an active business on the site for over six months. A building trades and services use is not permitted in the R3 multifamily zoning district and cannot be reestablished per section 34-343 of the land of regulations. This was an app, a, um, interpretation, which I'll go into in the next page here, a uh, letter that was provided by Ms. Peggy Busaka, director of our department, to Mr. Jason Lawson. So the analysis is this. The Lawson Masonry and Construction Company Incorporated is a building trades and services use. The building trades and services use operated as a non-conforming use at 1190 Queen Street. The building trades and services use is not permitted in the R3 multifamily high density residential zoning district. According to the city's records, the last BTR issued at 1190 Queen Street for Lawson Masonry Construction Company Incorporated was on October 15, 2012. The BTR expired on September 30, 2013. In addition, our customer services staff reports that water service was shut off in 2015. Section 34-343 of the city's land development regulations states, a use not in conformance with the, with the land development regulations shall not be changed to another non-conforming use or reestablished after discontinuance for a period of six months. Although annual fire inspections, which um, I did not include in the packet, but I did leave on the dais there for you, um, have been conducted on the property and minimal use of electricity has continued. The lack of a current BTR for over six years and the lack of water service for approximately four years supports the conclusion that there has not been an active business on the site for over six months. 
the applicant appeal this interpretation, and that's why we're here tonight. We, uh, staff just recommends that, this, that the board concurs with the administrative interpretation of what the code states, based on the information that I'll, I'll, I'll describe here. On page uh, 116 of your packet, you'll see the letter that was submitted, uh, sent uh, by Ms. Peggy Busaka to Mr. Jason Lawson on October 24th, 2019. She states that she reviewed the following information provided by him regarding continuation of a business located at 1190 Green Street. There's a letter from Senior Fire Inspector Brian Weber stating that fire, fire, annual fire inspections have been performed at 1190 Main Street since 2005. Copies of several electric bills paid for 1190 Queen Street, the latest dated October 3rd, 2019. The applicant also provided evidence of a current fire extinguisher and receipts for fire extinguisher inspection, inspections in 2015, 16, 17, and 19. This was when we met with Mr. Lawson to see if he could provide to us any evidence to help determine, establish that the, there was a business in continuance since to the expiration of the VTR to help us determine that the grandfather status or rather the non-conforming use that continued, this is the evidence that was provided to us. So based on this and the evidence that we have in our own records, um, the, the Peggy, Ms. Busaka stated, according to the city's records, the last VTR issued at 1190 Queen Street was for Lawson Masonry Construction Company on October 15, 2012 and expired the next year. And also the water was shut off in 2015. So the Code basically states that we're supposed to look at several things when we're considering whether a non-conforming use has lost its non-conforming status, and that is the loss of a VTR over six months and or electric and water discontinuance and other evidence that could be considered as well by the administrator. And that's what the code states, and I'll point that out in a moment. On page uh, 117 of your packet, you'll see the application uh, requesting for the uh, appeal of the, or of the uh, interpretation by Mr. Lawson. Um, the, the applicant, this is the business tax receipt that was expired in 2013 on page 118 of your packet. Uh, I did include some evidence of communication with Mr. Lawson as far back as 2014 uh, between our um, BTR staff and community development on page 119 of your packet. There's a letter here um, from our BTR staff to Mr. Lawson dated 2015. That's on page 120 of your packet, indicating the loss of the, uh, or the, the need to renew the uh, BTR. Um, We did provide, uh, receive several questions from Mr. Lawson. That's on page 121 of your packet, and we provided answers to those questions about the BTR process. Uh, one question, I think some of these questions Mr. Lawson and his representatives will try to uh, address here, that there was lack of information provided to them through this process, as far, especially as far as um, the fact that there's a the loss of non-conforming status here. Um, on page 122 of your packet, I've included a section of the code. The use, building trades and services use in our code. It's allowed in certain zoning districts, but specifically prohibited in the R3 multifamily zoning district. So if it was established there, when that zoning district was put there, then it's just a non-conforming use, it just continues. And we have many examples like that in the city. But once they discontinue more than six months, and other circumstances, according to the code, the administrator has the ability to determine whether that's lost that non-conforming status. And that's where we're here today. You'll see on page 123 of your packet, a zoning map, and this is the location of the property. It's at the northeast corner of Elizabeth Avenue and Queen Street. You can see the surrounding zoning on the property is primarily residential, R1B, R3, R1C. There is the Inspiration Village uh, development uh, that the city helped implement uh, with the PUDZ zoning, that's the Plan Unit Development Zoning, immediately to the east. And then there is also one area there at the corner of Queen Street and Dillion that has a neighborhood commercial zoning. There's actually a commercial use there. The aerial on page 124 of your packet 
I'm not sure of the date of the aerial, but this, uh, in, you can see that half the property has a building there towards the street. Um, and then there's some outdoor storage that appears behind the building. I've included correspondence with, uh, between our staff and uh, Ms. Carrie Beatty with customer service, who's also here to answer any questions if you have about um, the customer service and the water, shut off of the water and the communication that that department had with, with the applicant. That's on page 125 of your packet. And I also included some history that we re, uh, dug up from our archives. From what we understand, the construction business was established on this property at least since the 1950s. And the city's first zoning code was established in 1964. And from what I understand, what we, what we see here, what we found was that the property was zoned residential at the time or partial residential that may have allowed some commercial at the time. We're not exactly sure what the zoning code really said at that time. However, in 1976, there was a request we found here on page 127 of your packet uh, from Mr. Um, Joe Lewis Lawson. There was a rezoning request at that year to try and rezone it from a residential classification to a BW classification. We believe that stands for business warehouse. That was denied. And for reasons that the surrounding uh, properties were residential and that the requested rezoning was incompatible. Then later on, on page 129 of your packet, we saw, uh, we found another record by the same Mr. Lawson to rezone the property in 1985 to a commercial use again and was successful. And we believe it was rezoned to a BW, a business, a, a, I believe that stands for business warehouse, with a binding site plan. And the site plan included many warehouse. That was never constructed. So that zoning just continued on that property until if you if you recall, we had an administrative citywide rezoning that happened in 1993. And the entire city was rezoned with brand new zoning districts. And this property was rezoned back to a residential use zoning district at that time in 1993, thereby making the business there again non-conforming. I believe that is On page 142 of your packet, the reason why we believe this happened is because this, we found some notes from the staff's records at that time in 1993. It appears that they recognized the property had a BW or business warehouse type zoning on the property, and they indicated that in that area it was going to be rezoned back to R3. We also found on page 143 of your packet in our records that um, there was a recognition again that the property had a BW zoning on it and it was the Mr. Lawson site, as you can see there highlighted. On page 144 of your packet, um, this is a letter that was provided, submitted to us by Mr. Lawson, uh, Jason Lawson on October 13, 31st this year. He indicated that his father was the owner of the business and the original applicant, the previous rezonings. And he passed away, I believe, in 2013. And this is the reason why the business lapsed, because at the same time, uh, there was an issue as far as getting, going through probate and getting the business reestablished with a general new general contractor. And the code, our code requires that a business trades and services use have a general contractor license person there in order to get that BTR there. Uh, there are some, uh, the rest of the, uh, the exhibits here were submitted by the applicant. Page 146 is the water meter, an image of the water meter. 147 is a uh, uh, I believe it's some documentation from the Department of Business and Professional Regulation that was provided to us by Mr. Lawson. Um, and also a, it looks like a sun, or a division, uh, 
a SunViz records here he provided to us. We also, he also provided to us the FPL uh, bills uh, on page 151 through 153 of your packet. And there's some uh, SunViz Division of Corporations information he provided to us on page 154 of your packet. Um, I do want to point out to you some additional exhibits since this publication of this agenda item uh, that we've laid copies of on your dies, but they are also available on the computer there if you want to minimize your, um, however you want to look at it. If you want to look at it electronically or use the hard copies there, I've also provided the uh, electronic copies inside the um, agenda star uh, icon on your desktop. Apologize, just one moment. So there were additional records that were provided to us by the Customer Services Department by Ms. Carrie Beatty, um, indicating to us the water balance and the communication her department has had with, with Mr. Lawson. Um, we also included the fire department violation or the inspection records. I apologize, I did not, that was, those were provided by Mr. Lawson to us, part of the application. I failed to include them as part of the packet, so you should have hard copies there. So you can see that our fire department did do an inspection of the business every year up to 2019. And with, with that, I'll try and answer any questions. Uh, well, we also did receive one additional piece of information, kind of a, a highlight or a background narrative from Mr. Lawson, uh, which I, we've also laid on the dais for you. Um, you should have that. If not, please tell me. Uh, Mr. Lawson will probably refer to that during his presentation. With that, I'll try and answer any questions you have about this. Brad, without a business license, why was the fire department still going back and doing fire inspections? Our understanding is that they were operating, uh, or their records are based on a different system. Some departments have a different record system than other departments. We also, sometimes we don't share the same record system. So when I spoke with the fire department, that was the uh, response that I received. And so I believe there's just lack of communication between the staff that uh, processes business tax receipts and fire department. That has been rectified in the past couple of years. So they are fees, I believe, are, their fees are collected through our process. Um, but unfortunately, even after that, they, we did see that there was an, another inspection even as, as recent as two, this year. That's the best answer I can give you, sir. Other questions? Yes, sir. Just, um, you know, I, I saw this uh, sheet. Can you see it? Yes. This has the um, delinquent uh, water bills, actually, right? If they pay this, then, then they are okay? Let me just make sure I, I understand which uh, sheet you're referring to. This is the sheet in, entitled um, Utility Services Lean Payoff. Lean Payoff, okay. So, I'm sorry, your question is if they pay this off, they are okay? The lean that? payoff, because what we are basing this on is like they haven't paid any water bills. That is part of the basis. That's not the sole basis. So there's a B. But that's the main, that's one, uh, two parts. One is the water bill, the other one is what? Is the B lack of a BTR. BTR. Yes. Okay. Have they, have they uh, been um, issued any, like, construction permits? Like, if, if he wants to do any construction in the city, they usually come in and pull a permit, right? For the site? No, not for the as site. A, as a as, a as part of the business? Yes. If the... I, I would say in that scenario where if there's a business still in operation there and they're asked to pull permits for a project somewhere else in the city, 
Um, if we find that the business that's pulling that permit is located in an area or in a, in a property that's non-conforming, I think we would probably say that it, we couldn't allow them to operate. In other words, it, it still we have to ask them, can you provide to us a renewal of that BTR? I think that's probably what our answer would be. I, I, I think that answers your question. I, I'm not sure. You know, I'm just asking a question. If they, if they uh, have a function right here in the city, like they have a project that they're working with, they have to come to the city and pull a permit to do it. <coughs> would the city then would look at their BTR, see if it's paid? Or if they have a BTR? I believe that depends. Um, I, I wouldn't be, I, I can't really give you a good answer on that because uh, that depends on the process, the BTR. We, what we do, we don't fact check every time someone comes in to ask for a permit, whether they're a good business or, or a proper business or not. Um, that really depends on the type of permit they're asking for. Okay. And also, too, what we do, we do an annual renewal request. So we send out notices to all businesses within the city yeah. that have a BTR to ask them to renew. And then those that do not within a timely manner, then we send them letters ask, telling them that they're delinquent. question the, the structures at the location are empty for at least many I mean it, people live there it's a place of, uh, an active place of business just not well documented or it's vacant I'd have to defer to the applicant on that or property owner on that question as far as I understand uh, the buildings are are not occupied for has, for, for habitation They're not residential structures uh, it was an office, from what I understand, for many years, and there was an outdoor storage area in the back. Just uh, looking at the aerial, looking at back to 1999, or something, you know, before before even uh, 1999, there always were, you know, used to be a uh, tra trailers there. You know, looking at at uh, basically Google Maps, and and then there was always a trailer or two in the back of the property and um, residential units don't have big trailers like that. Okay, any other questions of staff? Yes, sir. I, um, in looking through the record, there's, there was quite a bit of going back and forth for the, for the use changes and this is confusing to me, and I would hate to be the applicant trying to figure out what, what I'm allowed to do and what I'm not allowed to do going back through the record. Can you clarify that a little bit as, as to, one, it was originally R3, two, it was BW Business Warehouse, three, it went back to R3, and then back to BW again? No, it's currently R, R3 right now. Okay. So when it was rezoned in, back to R3 in 1993, that's the current zoning on the property now. Okay. Yeah. But it was being grandfathered because it was an ongoing operation at that time. That's correct. Okay, so it remained, as long as it stayed an ongoing operation, it was allowed to be there under that R3 setting. On, on that same note, um, going to Mr. Chehab's question a moment ago, if permits were being issued to the company over the time since Mr. Joe Lewis Lawson has passed away, and I were the owner of that property, I might think that I'm okay with the city. I'm doing what I need to do. I'm getting fire inspections. I'm paying my water bill when I can. Don't really need water a whole lot in the in construction office. That's That's just something we have to consider. That's... All right, any other questions for staff? And we'll open it up. I don't see any lights. We'll open up the public hearing at this time. I, how many total cards do we have? Four. Four cards, We have four, right. yes. Okay. And our first card then would be Mr. We'll Lawson. Jason Lawson, and also there's a Karen Lawson Griffin. All right. 
I'll let both of you come up and both of you introduce yourselves to us. Thank you. I see someone else making motion, and you are, sir? And your relation with them, sir? I'm the principal of Paul's Family Company, and we have some other districts that I think. Very good, sir. Please join. Give us your names, please. That would simplify things from having everybody go up and down. My name is uh, Jason Lawson. My address is 945 Waker Avenue, Titusville, Florida. I've okay. been a resident of Titusville for 42 years. All right. All right. Let's introduce everyone else, please. And my name is Karen Griffin, Karen Lawson Griffin, and my address is 3707 Sawgrass Drive here in Titusville, Florida. Okay. And you, sir? <clears throat> my name is Arthur Edwards. Uh, my address is 5325 Amy Way, Mims, Florida. Most people call me Art. Uh, and I would like to address a couple of questions that were asked earlier, if I could. Uh, one question was concerning permits being pulled. Uh, the work that was uh, on the books at the time that Joe passed away was completed, but there has been no permits pulled since that time. Uh, one other thing is a point of clarification. If you go to Leon, uh, you know where the new apartments are being built? Um, the street that the uh, office is on is the very next street that runs east and west. If you turn, after you pass those apartments, uh, there's a store on the corner on the, on the left-hand side. There's also a barbershop on the Leon before you turn. Those two properties uh, zone, I think it's MC, which allows them to be commercial, uh, mixed-use commercial, I think is, is uh, what it is. But just down the streets, I'd say 500 yards or less, is lost in construction that has this crazy zoning thing attached with it. I'm not sure how this business got mi uh, missed because uh, Lawson is fronting um, Queen Street as is one of those businesses uh, that is zoned where they don't have an issue. Uh, so that, that kind of clears up hopefully some questions that were, were asked. And, and since I'm talking, if you don't mind, I'll, there's some other things I'd like to, to pass on. Um, first of all, let me talk about my relationship. Uh, I've known Jason since he was a, a child. His father, uh, Joe, and I were very, very good friends. In fact, we were Masonic brothers, uh, which in a lot of cases gives uh, a kinship that uh, is as close as brothers. Uh, Joe also mentored me. I'm a general contractor, and he mentored me as I became a general contractor. I worked full time at the Space Center. Uh, but I also did contracting from 1989 until 2007. Um, Jason, if I, if I may so, be so bold as to say this, Jason was raised to run this business. Joe built this business with the intention of it being a family business. Jason came up in the business. But Jason was a field superintendent. He, he was not the business person. Joe was the business person. When Joe passed away, uh, he was a license holder. When he passed away, the license was no, was no longer valid. He could not uh, pull a BTR. Uh, that would be illegal for him to try and do that. They went through probate, had properties in Okeechobee, all over Florida, uh, South Carolina, Titusville, all over. It took a while to probate that property. Uh, we pulled together a little matrix. And what this matrix shows is 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 it kind of speaks to some of the points that's been made so far on the podium, is Jason, again, if I can speak for Jason, he was doing all the things that he thought he needed to do to run a business. Uh, he was getting this annual inspection, the lights were on, the phone was on, um, he didn't need water, so he thought he, could, he, he would be okay without the water. But if you look at this, this little sheet of paper here, it will show that until 2019, he was doing all the things that he thought was the right thing to do. Um, he came to me and asked me if I would qualify the company. He had talked to another person before me, and, and that didn't work out. 
and I told him I would. My, li my license has been inactive since 2007. So we, we had to go through the process of reactivating my license, which meant I had to go through some continuing education classes. Uh, he found out later on he had to have some insurances that he wasn't aware of, some fairly expensive insurances. But he's done all the things that he thought he needed to do to get his business up and going. And he came up to get his BTR on, and it was quite a shock to find out that he couldn't. Now, I'm a rules person. Uh, I worked in an environment where you follow the rules. Uh, you know, you had procedures, you had the rules, and you followed the rules. And I, I, I thoroughly believe in following the rules, but we've got a case of a perfect storm. Uh, we've got a case where the patriarch of this family passed away. When he passed away, the license was no longer valid. His, his estate has to be probated before anybody can do anything. Well, once it's, once it's probated, they can now go to Sunbiz and they can reestablish the company with Chasen as being the person in charge. All of this took quite some time. Uh, there are some things that have to be cleared up, and the water is one of those things. And I just questioned Jason a few minutes ago because I wanted to be sure before I, I came up here and started talking that that's going to get taken care of, irregardless of what your decision is, uh, because that's the right thing to do. But beyond that, um, I, I really think we ought to let uh, him go and open his business. Now, let me share something. Uh, I've dealt with uh, young people for a long, long time. Uh, I'm a charter board member of the Boys and Girls Club in Bowie County. We had a... Uh, a young man that joined the Boys and Girls Club when we first opened down at the Gibson Center. And he shared with me about five years ago that before he joined the Boys and Girls Club, he had his career all charted out. He was going to be a drug dealer. Really, I'm serious. And, and he was 13 years old when he made that decision that he wanted to be a businessman and the easiest and best thing he could do was to be a drug dealer. Now, loss in construction helps to eliminate drug dealers. Loss in construction ha has hired a lot of people in this county. There are people in this audience. Warnada Houston, who worked for the city of Titusville. I think she was his first secretary. Mm -hmm. Jeff Davis, uh, who is the superintendent for Parks and Recreation, as a young guy in high school. He worked for Joe Lawson. There's a bunch of people in this audience that's worked for Joe Lawson. There are people in this audience that didn't work for Joe, but Joe helped out. Jason has the same heart. If you close this, if you close this business down, it sends a bad message to that community because there's not a lot of hope in that community. So again, I'm a rules person. I firmly believe in rules, but sometimes, sometimes you have to say that's an exception to the rule. And, and that's basically, I think, what Jason is looking for, is for a little compassion, because if he has to move his office outside of the area, uh, office is paid for, it's going to cost at least $1,000 a month just for rent. That building is going to be dormant. It's going to become a blight on the community. And sooner or later, it's just going to be a, another sore thing in the city of Tattersville. There's a lot of reasons to not, to not deny him. A lot of reasons. So, uh, Jason. <laughs> it's like, okay, it's like really good. Um, you summed it up. <laughs> All I can say is, you know, due to, you know, some extenuating circumstances, you know, we as a family had to, uh, you know, go through and probate my father's estate. It took quite some time. Um, my sister Karen Lawson Griffin is here. I mean, she's the executive of my father's estate who put in, you know, a lot of work, you know, trying to get me to this point, to where I am now. Because the estate had to be probated in order for me to get to where I am to obtain a BTR license. And I have been working with Mr. Edwards to get this business qualified as a general contracting company with the Department of Business and Professional Regulation, which we have successfully completed. And all I can say is I would like to request the appeals board to take the needed action 
to allow Lawson Mason Ranch construction to continue and reestablish within the city of Titusville. And I'm just gonna share a little bit of history of, about the company. Um, like Jason said, I did become the executor of the estate. Not only did I have to probate here in Florida, I had to also probate in South Carolina as well. And I learned a lot. So I won't go into details on that. But I will say the business has always operated as a commercial entity. The company had two offices here in Titusville and Okeechobee, Florida. And we also performed work throughout the state of Florida. The very steps that we walked on prior to entering this building tonight were done by Lawson Construction some years ago. Our late father performed a great deal of work for the city of Titusville. He performed work on the launch pads at KSC, where I work now. He was the first minority owned company to perform the masonry and concrete work on the former Miracle City Mall for which our family was presented with a brick encased in glass from the demolition that I have in my house right now, but we want to put it in the office once we get that BTR. Uh, this was presented to us at our home church, St. James AME Church right there on Dummett, by our former pastor, Glenn Dames, along with former Brevard County Commissioner, Robin Fisher, who is a resident of Titusville. The business has a reputable repu reputation, and we are asking the board to take the necessary steps needed to grant us the BTR, or occupational license, so that we can continue operating the business and carrying out our father's dream that we would follow the course and foundation left by him to continue his legacy. Okay, uh, any other questions that we have? May I ask, uh, well, we, we see the water bill is in remiss. Have the property taxes been taken care of over this time? Are they up to date? They're not up to date. To date. However, we are, when our father passed, we, we currently have to maintain and take care of 26 properties here in Titusville. There's also... Uh, I think, let's see, this is our list of properties. Okay, so it's been a learning experience for us. Dad was a mover and a shaker. I've learned and he's learned. We've became movers and shakers. So we're, we're, we've gotten everything, all the properties here in Titusville except the office. If you look, all those properties are totally paid up and we're taking care of 26 properties. So the office is the only thing we have. Also, taxes in South Carolina. You have to take care of taxes in South Carolina within one year. You don't have that luxury of three years. All taxes in Carolina paid for one, two, three, four, five, six properties, which consists of about 13 acres. Um, Okeechobee, all taxes are paid have had to deal with the city of Okeechobee. I had a building torn down um, recently. Um, I've dealt with code enforcement in Okeechobee as well as Titusville. Everything's good to go. So yes, we do recognize that our taxes are behind on the office, but have no doubt those taxes are being addressed. We are addressing everything, the water bill, our intent is to get that water bill paid before hopefully we open the office back up. But it's just been an enormous, I'll be honest with you, an enormous amount of stuff that we had to acquire and get our hands and grasp around. But we're getting there. All right, thank you. Are there other questions from other members? Yep, there's a way. Uh, Mr. Lawson, have you looked at uh, the possibility of opening uh, your business as uh, an owner-occupied uh, residential occupancy type thing, owner-occupied? 
In other words, operating it out of your house. No, I mean, there's a corporation. There's the, oh. Well, this is a corporation, so it'll be kind of. You, you still could do that. Out of the residence? Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's, you'd lose your lay down area unless that, that would be the big thing. You wouldn't have that storage area behind the building, but uh, it would get you to a point where you could open the doors. Uh, actually, in the office, it's, it's, uh, it's set up for a construction business. I don't know if you've ever been there. I, I have. But it, it has a large conference yes. room. It has a drawing table. Yes. It has all the files and the storage. It would be pretty difficult to get that stuff moved uh, yeah. to a house. All right. Uh, and, uh, and that structure is not suitable for, for to be a residence? No. It would originally was built for, as a residence. I'm, I'm pretty sure. No, I don't think so. No, 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 you don't think so. No, it doesn't have a. Does it have a kitchen? I know it's not a kitchen. No, it just has a little room. It has like a little break, like a little noodle, little kind nook, of a thing. But yeah. it's not. Okay. All right. Okay, that answers my question. Yes, sir. Dr. George Faison, Sr. Mr. Chairman, as I used to call you. <laughs> Welcome. I'm George Faison, Sr. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> the Lawson family, honorable people. Uh, people who have uh, set examples for the kids that I had the opportunity of uh, teaching uh, <clears throat> in the various schools. Uh, my last uh, title was the coordinator of vocational projects, Barbara Vaud County. <clears throat> and uh, Joe Lawson sets an example for those who uh, come out of those uh, classes. <clears throat> And I'm sure that uh, the young man who came before you, who grew up under his dad, <clears throat> would continue to be the example that Joe set uh, for those kids who came out of our public schools. And uh, I would ask uh, that you would uh, consider uh, meeting the request that is before you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lawson. Any questions for him? Thank you, sir. And there are no more cards to be seen? No, sir. Thank you. This time we'll close the public hearings. Um, I have a question for staff. Did you receive from our signs or your mailers any feedback from the community in a negative light uh, for this variance to be appealed? Uh, no, sir. We've received no communication from the public regarding this. Okay. So there's been no objection. No objection from the public. They meet the same criteria. You still send out the cards to so so close to the property to those owners, property owners, correct? We send notices to the property owners within 100 feet of the property. And we yeah. treat this. And you got those no little, different, si no little signs out there that get wet and lay down. <laughs> there is a sign. There should be a sign on the property. <laughs> They're wimpy signs. I'm sorry. <laughs> you better signs. Okay, so we even received no. Nobody objecting. Correct. All right. Any other comments or feedback from this group? I personally never knew Mr. Lawson. I've only been here since 93. So I've not had dealings with him. But I don't know if anybody else. <laughs> you can't remember. Yeah, we're all getting older. <laughs> Don't laugh at me. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, yes, sir. Uh, I've, I knew Mr. Lawson quite well. Uh, I know Jason. I've worked with Mr. Edwards uh, and recognize Sharon. Um, they've always been above, above board with everything they've done. Uh, not saying that that's 
a reason to overturn an administrative decision, but uh, everything they've said about the quality of the family is, is correct. I will make one comment. I know that there's been problems in the past with some of the equipment, and that may have been during that time when, after his death, there was some derelict equipment, shall we say, or machineries parked around the plot, if I'm not, if I remember correctly. Y'all can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, it seemed like there was some code issues in the past from things being collected out there, but maybe I'm wrong. Uh, I assume you'd keep this lot cleaned up and looking very presentable now. All right. Okay. Do we have any recommendations from this board or further comments? I had a question for staff. Um, is there any other avenue uh, to pursue to allow them to go back into business? That's that's really the bottom line. What 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 course of action can they take? Is we've had several discussions with Mr. Lawson about his options, and we've talked about uh, rezoning the property to a pro to a zoning district that will allow an industrial or, or construction type use there. Uh, we're not sure what zoning district that would be that we could recommend because most of the zoning districts that will allow that use require it to be located adjacent to a collector or to an arterial roadway which this is not the other option is to maybe petition to the city council for a change in the code what that would be i'm not sure what that would recommendation recommendation would be so maybe city council would ask us for direction but right now we're working under what how the code is written so I, I, those could be options to the applicant if this fails. Um, otherwise, you probably could find that we are an error in interpreting the code based on the evidence that's been provided to you. Or as you ask, we are one of the avenues for discussion. So, all right. Yes, uh, please. Okay. Uh, about between us, you can turn on your mic. Close, yeah. you turn on your mic. We'll solve this guy's yes. <laughs> but when when we are looking at this, when looking at um, you know the um, getting back into business. You need to try to talk into your mic so it breaks. I'm sorry. Yeah, just uh, you know, none of these um, the error. Of course, the, the city is not in an error. The business has been operating for the longest time, that's one thing, and it stopped for a while. And there's a legitimate reason why they stopped. Um, now they wanna start the business again, and this property, it looks like, no matter, going back 30 years, 40 years, it's still the same. It's like there is the construction in the back of the property. There is, there is a evidence of construction equipment or um, you know, being a business in the back of the property. And until from, from 30 years ago, 40 years ago. So uh, how do we approach it today is by saying that there is no BTR, then we, there is no business. And I, you know, this is like a confusing to me that uh, how do you interpret that? How do you, just because they didn't pay the water bill, does that take their business away? I don't think that should be the case. And 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 R three, you know, you can't have uh, a house and a and a and a business inside the house. This is it looks like you know I looked at it. It looks like it's a small, very tiny office building with a with a structure in the back, set up for a. It needs to be cleaned up, of course, you know. But but that's that's a business. That's a that's a construction business normally. If you go down to probably Bobby Lane, you know, just uh, uh, for Driveway Inc., and you look in the back, it looks the same. So uh, that's my my uh, my thinking is, you know, the business was interrupted. So how how could it be brought back 
into. If I may, I same to answer your question and to Mr. Willis's question about process and options. If you look at the exhibit that was given to us by Mr. Lawson and Mr. Edwards, um, it's titled, um, let's look at the history here. He provided to us, it's a matrix. Um, on one of the pages, he states here um, that the hardship request, the rules designed to control land usage have put the Lawson Masonry and Construction Company in an untenable no-win position with loss of business location as the only possible outcome under the current land use rules. So uh, when we interpret the code, we have to interpret it based on what it states, not what the circumstances of the applicant is. Um, so I, I don't know if that's something you need to consider um, or if that's, um, but that, that's basically some of the evidence that the applicant has provided to you. And I wanted to point that out to you since you've brought up your points and Mr. Willis brought up his, his questions about options. In, in reference to, to, this is a two, almost a two acre, uh, how, how big is the property? 2.7 acres? Two point two acres. Two point two acres, and how big is are these lots? The ones that that uh, to this to the to the east of the one that were created recently, they're like point point two acres or something. They are very very tiny little lots. Are you referring to the PUDZ zone of the Inspiration right. Village development? So those residential lots are it look like a tenth of an acre. Point tenth, twelve. Yeah. Tenth point one two acres. Yeah. So in order for him to use this property for anything. He has to subdivide it, basically. Well, and the residential zoning does allow a variety. He doesn't. He can put an apartment complex as under I know. one lot. Yeah. But he has to go through the process. That's it means correct. Creating something for him to do that he doesn't want to do that. He wants to use the property, right? Correct. The zoning would require a process in order to establish process, residential right. use. Yes. And that's a tremendous amount of. I I think, in my opinion, that would be a hardship on somebody to do something like that today. Accept the appeal, or we do not deny this appeal. I I make a motion to accept the appeal. Right. I'll second that. We got a motion to accept uh, and a second. Uh, is there any further discussion? Very good. May we have roll call, please? Vice Chairman Shahayan. Yes. Chairman Taylor. Yes. Member Wheelis? Yes. Member Johnson? Yes. Alderman Member Mandernack? Yes. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to have you here. All right. Uh, at this time, you have the we have a we have a, a portion of our where you petitions and requests can be made from the public. Is there any wish anybody in the public wish to speak? Very good, sir. Again, please identify yourself. I'm Dr. George L. Pearson, Senior. I uh, served on boards, and I think I had that young man that I was chairman of a board that he served on, and this guy appeared often. Let me say to you fellas, thank you for volunteering your service. It's the rent we pay for an organized community. And thank you for your decision this evening. Continue. Thank you, Dr. Faison. Thank you. All right, uh, reports. Staff, what have you got to enlighten us with? Your next meeting is gonna be January 22nd, I believe, right? Uh, actually, a little later than that. I believe it's going to be January 29th. That's the last Wednesday. It's the fifth month. It's the fifth Wednesday. So we're going to move to the fifth. Right. Yeah. 
that it'll be different this time around. Brian, it's because of P and Z. Because of P and yeah, I'm sorry, because the Planning and Zoning Commission will have their meeting on the 22nd. Ah. So therefore, being your meeting has, has been pushed back to the 29th. Ah, okay. Council's meeting is usually right before yours, so theirs is the 28th. Ah, because of the schedule. You yeah, 29th will be our uh, date for our next meeting. And we do anticipate uh, variance items for that night. We do have some items in the pipeline. All right. Oh, goody. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, Councilor, do you have anything to report to us? Our alternate member, William Kilpatrick, is no longer a member of this board as he has put in an application to be on the Code Enforcement Board. And so there is now an alternate vacancy with the appointment of Richard Willis as our regular member on one of our official building trades. So that's the summary of our shifting of members. And other than that, I have no report other than to wish you all a happy holiday. Happy holiday to you. Thank you. Merry Christmas. All right. Thank you. So, yes, we have a vacancy now. Again. Oh, God, we just got them filled. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's been so good. Any members have anything to report? Well, welcome, welcome aboard. We're glad to have you here. Thank you. And it's my honor. Glad, we're glad we're not running with four and waiting for somebody else, three coming in, somebody else in the door to make it happen. Uh, at this time, I have nothing else to report and except to say everyone have a happy, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Then we'll adjourn this meeting. Thank you.